In 1960, audiences witnessed two serial killers on film almost at the same time. The first was Peeping Tom in April, and then Psycho in June. The amazing thing about this was that most horror in cinema, to date, involved aliens invading Earth or going to some strange locale, like the Arctic, jungles, or even Transylvania. But thanks to the success of Psycho, other human killers would soon grace, or disgrace, cinema. As time went on, other films would appear in theaters every few years. Some were successful, and some were ignored. Though technically these films were very different, they did have the commonality of a human killer who seemed to enjoy killing for various reasons. In the 70s, a few movies would come out like this, like The Sorority House Slaughter of Black Christmas and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre in the same year. Many would have to leave their comfortable neighborhoods to find these killers, like going to a strange hotel in Psycho, or living in a city, like Peeping Tom, or head out to the middle of nowhere to dance with Leatherface. But Halloween was a film good enough to change this trend of filmmaking forever. Halloween would make the killer more personal, in that he came to our houses and lingered in our suburban neighborhoods, watching and eventually intruding. When John Carpenter was five, his family moved to a log house on the campus of Western Kentucky University, where his father accepted a position of music professor on the campus in Bowling Green, Kentucky. He grew up loving film like Howard Hawks westerns and horror such as The Thing from Another World, Godzilla, and The Forbidden Planet. By the time he was 14 years old, he was making his own films on an 8mm camera. He would spend two years going to college in Western Kentucky University, but he really wanted to study film, so he took the leap and moved to California to attend USC School of Cinematic Arts in 1968. In 1969, Carpenter would make a short film called Captain Voyeur. I mention this short because throughout the entire film, the main character looks for women to lust after while he is masked. In one scene in particular, you can definitely see parallels to his later Halloween film, when the main character is breathing heavy as he looks upon a woman. In 1969, he assisted as a co-writer, film editor, and music composer for The Resurrection of Bronco Billy, which won an Academy Award for Best Live Action Short Film. But Carpenter's real break was Dark Star. After teaming up with Dan O'Bannon, John Carpenter threw himself into a student project that would inevitably cause him to drop out of college to focus on making the film. USC gave a $1,000 budget to start, but the movie soon grew out of hand. By 1972, the first version of the film was complete, but they searched for investors and found Jonathan Kaplan, who gave them $10,000 to complete the movie. Thanks to John Landis, who was a friend of Dan O'Bannon's, the film would find a distributor who demanded cuts, and they catered to such demands to get it in theaters. And instead of the, the most impressive student film ever made, we had the least impressive professional film ever made. Though O'Bannon claims it was the least impressive in his eyes, it did get O'Bannon recognized. O'Bannon would later be tapped by Alejandro Jodorowsky to make Dune because of the effects in Dark Star, and the film itself would be the germ for O'Bannon's desire to make a real scary alien movie, which would later become Alien. As for Carpenter, he was praised for making low-budget films, but not much else. Carpenter thought studios would be getting in touch with him after his movie was released due to its unique look and cultural themes, but there was nothing. So, he worked on his two scripts instead. One was called Eyes, which later became The Eyes of Laura Mars, and the other was called Assault, which Carpenter hoped would be a western. He managed to find backers for Assault, and since it was only $100,000, he changed the script to become what we know today as Assault on Precinct 13. He would shoot the film in 20 days, and when it came out, it did fair. But when Assault on Precinct 13 hit Britain, 
it became a cult movie overseas, and it was very successful there. It would take time for Assault to become popular in the United States, but inevitably, it too became a cult movie. The person responsible for getting the movie to Europe to find that audience was distributor Erwin Yablons, who is known to work with Mustafa Akkad. According to Yablon's autobiography, The Man Who Created Halloween, Yablon's had just created a production company, and on a flight home, he kept musing what kind of product would be their first venture. He stated he knew it had to be a horror film. He thought about Psycho and The Exorcist and wanted to match that success. He stated he wanted to make a film about babysitters in jeopardy. He also believed the film should take place on one night and contained to one location to save on the budget of the film. Suddenly, the eureka moment hit me. The light bulb above my head lit up. Why not set the movie on the night that celebrates fright? Hell, why not call the movie Halloween? Now, there are some outlets that suggest Halloween was originally going to be called the Babysitter Murders. And your original idea was the Babysitter Murders? No, that's, no? that's the misconception. Okay. And there are those as well that claim the idea of a killer stalking babysitters was copied from an urban legend that started around the 60s after the death of Janet Christman in Columbia, Missouri, who was killed when she was 14 babysitting. This then became an urban tale told by babysitters to be wary of getting the phone as it might be a man hiding upstairs. There were a few short movies and foreign films about the subject, but I'm not going to assume the filmmakers saw any of these films or call any of them liars to fit such a narrative. The very night Yablons arrived back home, he called Carpenter at around 9 p.m. and asked him to meet him for lunch the next day. During that lunch, Yablons pitched the idea and asked if Carpenter would make it for $300,000. And Carpenter said yes, and he had enthusiasm for the project. When Carpenter said yes to making the movie, he wanted creative control. He also wanted his girlfriend, Deborah Hill, to be part of the production and that he would direct, write, and score the film. He also said... He wanted his name above the title of the film, wherever it appeared. Yablons thought it was a rather ballsy move for Carpenter to request this, but regardless, he agreed. In the end, Carpenter was paid 10000 for making the film, as well as a certain small percentage of the film's profits that in the long run didn't turn out to be small. Irwin then contacted his financial partner, Mustafa Akkad, and told him the premise for his new idea and the director he had in mind. Now, Mustafa did not live in America, so he didn't really understand the premise of Halloween, as it was not a holiday where he lived. But after a meeting, he saw the enthusiasm of Carpenter and Hill, and he trusted Irwin, so the funding was greenlit for this movie. When the writing process began, it was structured by three people, and each deserves a large portion of credit for what Halloween would become. The first was Deborah Hill. She created every teenage character and based it on her experiences from her youth. Hill grew up a Catholic schoolgirl who often babysat and brought those personalities to the girls and grounded the film from a teen perspective. Hill is on record writing all of the dialogue for Jamie Lee Curtis, PJ Souls, Nancy Loomis, Brian Andrews, Kyle Richards, and John Michael Graham. Later, when working on the set, Carpenter and Hill would work together directing the film. Carpenter was officially directing, but Deborah often served as something akin to a second unit director, and both Carpenter and her would chat after most scenes were filmed to make sure they had it right. Deborah's contribution to the script meant that when there was a question about girls' performance, or if it should be tweaked, she was usually involved in such moments. John Carpenter was responsible for writing the rest, especially Michael Myers and Dr. Loomis's character. Also, Carpenter contested, in support of Erwin Yablon's claims, that it has never been a theme in a film. My idea was to do an old haunted house film. Carpenter began to see the killer in the movie as something beyond man and referred to him as the shape. 
as in a presence that was beyond mortal and somewhat spiritual in nature. Another thing that was heavy behind the writing of Michael Myers was Sawin, or if you want to believe Dr. Loomis, it's a Celtic word, Samhain. It means the Lord of the Dead. Which was a Celtic tradition that occurred during the fall to prepare for winter. The idea was that you couldn't kill evil, and that was how we came about the story. We went back to the old idea of Samhain, that Halloween was the night where all the souls are let out to wreak havoc on the living, and then came up with a story about the most evil kid who ever lived. And when John came up with this fable of a town with a dark secret of someone who once lived there, and now that evil has come back, that's what made Halloween work. Piggybacking on those concepts, the book of the film would lay heavily into this stuff. And later, sequels would also refer to such things. The third principal player in the writing was Erwin Yablons, who was not credited but offered a ton of ideas. Some of his major ideas were... I want this to be theater of the mind, because I'm the last of the radio generation. Love it. Love it. I don't want the people to see as much as they think they see. It's the best. Think of Hitchcock, that was his style, and yep. think of even the exorcism. Yep. I said, what's scarier than walking up a staircase and not knowing what's at the other end? It's the it unknown. It's the anticipation that's right. That's right. Not the reality. I want no blood. I want no gore. He would also stress to have the film on Halloween night only, and to have it with limited locations, like a neighborhood street, to save money for the budget. Yablons also offered ideas that were not used by Carpenter or Hill, showing that in truth, they were allowed to have creative control in the end. Now there is some confusion over how long the script took to finish. It is stated that it took 10 days for the script by many sources. However, Hill states, a matter of factly, it took three weeks to write. It took us about three weeks to write the script. In the end, these three people made Halloween what it was in terms of spine, and they all deserve equal credit. John Carpenter is one of my favorite directors of all time, but it would be unfair for me to say that he was the only force that made this movie what it was, even though his name is forever linked to the title wherever you see it. Yablons and Hill were just as instrumental, and they should be acknowledged for that. The person John Carpenter wanted to be Loomis was Peter Cushing, but because Cushing was huge right now, since he was just in Star Wars, Carpenter wasn't even considered, because he was too expensive at the moment. In fact, when Deborah Hill called Cushing's agent, this is what she was told. So now after Star Wars, they're making movies about him. He's not in a movie about something else. Ah. Uh -huh. So I thought, okay. Instead, Carpenter decided to go after his plan B, Christopher Lee. While Carpenter was courting Lee for the part, Yablon's thought to cast him would be a huge mistake, as it would tie Halloween to the Hammer horror films that made Lee a known name. Thankfully for Yablon's, Lee would turn down the role, and years later, Lee would admit that it was the biggest mistake I made during my career. It was Yablon's who suggested Donald Pleasance, as he had already played a detective and an unhinged man already, and he could play a convincing, obsessed Loomis. Pleasance was offered 20000 for the part, even though the film's budget didn't cover that much. So, Yablons called Mustafa Akkad, who approved the expense. Thus, the final budget of the film would be 320000 Pleasance took the role, and one of the main reasons was because of his daughter Lucy, who loved Carpenter's score in Assault on Precinct 13. The first person Carpenter wanted for Lori was Anne Lockhart. Carpenter reached out to her, but she was booked like mad as she was filming two films, Convoy and Just Tell Me You Love Me, as well as many TV movies and television shows, including a commitment she had to a new television show called Battlestar Galactica. A casting call went out, and one of the actresses that responded jumped out to Deborah Hill. Jamie Lee Curtis was a fairly new actress who just finished Operation Petticoat, and Hill stated she did great in her audition. When Hill heard Jamie was the daughter, 
daughter of Janet Lee, she couldn't resist the connection. I knew casting Jamie Lee would be great publicity for the film because her mother was in Psycho. But Curtis wasn't initially sure she could play Lori because she related to the other two girls more. I was very much a smart aleck and was a cheerleader in high school, so I felt very concerned that I was being considered for the quiet, repressed young woman when in fact I was very much like the other two girls. Eventually, Jamie Lee would come around and was paid 8000 for her role. For the daughter of the town sheriff, Annie, Nancy Kyes was selected. Kyes used the name Nancy Loomis for her professional acting credits, and John Carpenter knew her because she played the part of Julie in his previous film, Assault in Precinct 13. Carpenter would use her again in The Fog. Halloween's art director Tommy Lee Wallace was dating Nancy when filming began for Halloween. Ironically, Charles Cyphers also worked on Assault on Precinct 13 as one of the police officers. So, he too would continue with Carpenter in this film, as well as The Fog, Escape from New York, and he would appear in Halloween 2, as well as Halloween Kills, as his reprising role as the sheriff. P.J. Souls was in Carrie, and Carpenter said the role was written with her in mind. At the time, Souls was married to Dennis Quaid, and the crew of Halloween tried to convince him to play Lydia's boyfriend, Bob Sims. But at the time, Dennis was committed to a television movie called Are You in the House Alone? For Michael Myers, it fell on Nick Castle, who was a friend of Carpenter since their days at USC. One day, Nick came to the set and asked what he could do to help. Carpenter said he could play the killer, and Nick got $25 a day when he was scheduled. Because the film was so tight, budget-wise, the costuming was simple. And we went to J.C. Penney, and we basically bought back-to-school clothes for this girl. Now this film was shot in an amazing 20 days and as such there were no rehearsals except for choreographed death scenes. To get an idea for how fast the film was shot, on the first day the scenes with Jamie Lee Curtis were her walking the streets and going up to Michael's house to leave the key and the girls talking on the way home from school, the car scene, and of course the hedges scene. At the end of the day, Jamie went home and later that night she got a phone call from Carpenter. She thought the call might be to fire her. He was like, hey darling, it's John. I just want to tell you how happy I am and how fantastic you were today. And I just know it's going to be amazing. Now, that just doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. And that was all John Carpenter. P.J. Souls also stated that John Carpenter was laid back. It was like working with family. Three takes and that was it. Actors were open to contribute to dialogue or suggestions for scenes. John and Deborah were very open to this. Between shots, anyone in the film helped with extra chores such as moving equipment and so on. It was a very collaborative effort and pretty much everyone unanimously attests the same. Even the community where Halloween shot pitched in as they would dress their kids up in Halloween costumes during the shoot. Since the production began in May 1978, it was a far cry from fall, so fall leaves were brought in and littered wherever the camera would film. After the shot was finished, the leaves would then be bagged up again for use with another scene. The only person that was a bit different was Donald Pleasance, who was kind and professional to the crew, but was a bit aloof during his five days of shooting his scenes. Tommy Lee Wallace stated sometimes Pleasance would be seen alone, pacing as he remembered his lines, while Carpenter stated he was a bit nervous around Pleasance, as the actor would often test the director's resolve because he wanted to be sure Carpenter was serious about his character. Despite the very very calm and fun shoot, Pleasance left the project somewhat nervous about his role, and he didn't quite get the character, thinking he was not believable. But Pleasance was professional enough to do exactly what Carpenter wanted him to do, though he didn't hide his misgivings to the press. As, as there are parts of the script which I'm now doing for John, which I can't accept, but I have to can you be specific about that without being rude? I believe people are behaving in a way in which they couldn't possibly in real life behave. It's, in other words, I think the script is a bit overwritten. It's a little melodramatic. And certainly in my role. 
For the score, Deborah Hill remembered that John was having ideas and hummed them while they wrote the script together. It is stated that he made the score in three days, and his main title became one of the most known tunes in Hollywood history. The amazing thing about Halloween is the time involved to make it. Pre-production for this film was four weeks. Production was four weeks, maximum, even though just 21 days was used, and post was four weeks as well, with an extra eight weeks open for possible recuts or tweaking. Now, you say... How long did it take? Well, how long could it take? John had four weeks to prepare the film. He had four weeks to shoot it and four weeks to finish it. So, Name any movie made within four months to the level of quality this film had and would be remembered so iconically for. It was unheard of. To get the film released was a chore in itself. Yablons invited all the studios to see the film, but none would ever show up and even Carpenter tried to court studio heads by showing them work prints without the score. One studio head said it wasn't scary at all and passed. Finally, Yablons knew that no studio could grasp what they had tried to do, so he decided to distribute the movie himself. Yablons turned to a friend, Joseph Wolf, for help, and he contacted MGM, who owed him a favor. He asked for 400 prints from the studio, and they gave it to him in their surprise. Prize. To get some awareness about the film to young audiences, they went to USC and screened it, and the students didn't seem impressed. And this would be the closest the film would ever get to a test screening. During the Q&A session, one of the students openly questioned why they would make such a film, as if it was beneath them. They replied that they wanted to make something stylish with the genre, and Hill even stated that they hoped that maybe it could have been a cult classic someday. The student who asked the question only replied condescendingly that such a thing would never happen. Regardless of Carpenter's attempts to impress his alma mater, things went forward and release was now looming. Halloween had little money for advertising beyond their preview and their poster, and as a result, it came out of nowhere for audiences. Now, there were two things that really helped this movie get traction. Word of mouth, which we will go into later, and the competition for this film, as it was a slow time for movies, and there was little people were interested in seeing. September had been a fairly calm month, and the only juggernaut that came out of that month was Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke, which was still in theaters when Halloween released. For early October, the big film was Midnight Express. Another recent film was The Big Fix, with Richard Dreyfuss and Jack Nicholson being domesticated in Going South. The week before Halloween, on October 20th, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes would make a sad 567000 and another movie called Despair, which didn't wow ticket sales either. On October 24th, a real treat was released in The Wiz, and audiences loved it, as it showed a strong 21 million box office take. Halloween would premiere the day The Wiz did in Kansas City, Missouri, but its official release date was Wednesday, October 25th. There was no other horror films that really competed with it unless you counted Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. The same night comes A Horseman debuted with Jane Fonda and James Caan and would eventually take $9.5 million. The first two nights receipts came in and the movie did not sell out. The theater houses were not empty either. After the first weekend, Deborah called John Carpenter and said, Looks like we bombed. Yablons was not dissuaded though. Systematically, he released the film from city to city, starting in California, and while on the West Coast, the film did not do that great, as critics bashed the movie, just like the college students of USC. It seemed their little film was not doing as well as they hoped. The following week, November 1st, more weak competition appeared at the box office, with the Great Bank hoax with Ned Betty and Burgess Meredith, the animated movie Watership Down, and another Donald Pleasance film called Power Play. These did not garner much money, as did Caravans, which was released on November 2nd with Anthony Quinn and Christopher Lee. But during that week, an event took place in Chicago. It was a 14th International Film Festival that took place from November 3rd to the 19th. 
and Yablons used this to get the movie seen and reviewed, and a critical thing happened. Nationally known critics Siskel and Ebert would see this film, and unlike the West Coast critics, they touted the film as smart, unique, and fresh for the horror genre. I cannot stress how important this was for the movie, as they had a national show called Sneak Previews and a large audience that trusted them. They not only gave the film a positive review, they championed the film. As you watch Halloween, your basic sympathies are always enlisted on the side of the woman, not with the killer. Mm -hmm. The movie develops its women characters as independent, intelligent, spunky, and interesting people. During the week of November 8th, Slow Dancing in the Big City with Paul Sorvino and Anne Ditchburn came out to less than 1.5 million in sales. But perhaps the biggest competition to Halloween was Magic, which was a horror film with Anthony Hopkins and Anne Margaret about a puppeteer whose puppet seems to be killing people. As Magic was seeing success at the box office, so too was Halloween, as it grew exponentially. As the film moved more into the East Coast, and good reviews were flowing in. The film was doing steady business, but over the next several weeks, a lot of small films that did not make it big only helped Halloween to get a foothold in theaters. By the time the animated Lord of the Rings came out on November 15th, the critics were coming out in mass and were cheerleading the film, and critical mass began to coalesce. By the time December came around, Halloween was a big deal, as it remained in theaters while all other films around it faded away. The film would even remain in theaters when The Deer Hunter came out, as well as Superman and Every Which Way But Loose, showing that it was a contender, and it was. It became the 10th highest grossing film of 1978. By the end of its initial release, over 20 million tickets would be sold for Halloween, which was amazing. It would go on to make 47 million in the United States, and then 23 million internationally, making it the most successful independent film of all time till 1999. This brings us to the end of another video and in our next video we will go into many things like theories and more behind the scenes details in scenes as we go along through the movie itself. Expect two more vids for our coverage on this movie. Until then try to refrain from giving in to your evil impulses. Stop that. Stop it. If you like what you see here, click like and subscribe. Use super thanks. It helps.